now since we didn't do them before the hymn. Uh, the only announcement that I have this morning is that next Saturday, which is, I believe, the second, if I have the dates right, is cleanup, thank you, <laughs> cleanup day here at the church starting at 10 o'clock. So I know it's been, well, we haven't had one since I've been here, so it's been a while <laughs> since we've been able to get together and um, enjoy some fellowship sometime together, as well as clean up the building for Easter and for the spring season and for the rest of the year, I guess. So Saturday the 2nd, next Saturday, this, you know, less than a week. So, yeah, so so come out and, and join in helping with that, 10 o'clock. Um, are there any other announcements? All right. Then we can continue with the call to worship, and I invite you to stand as able for that. Please join in the call to worship. Happy are those whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Happy are those to whom the Lord is no iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. When we acknowledge our sin to the Lord and do not hide our iniquity, we confess our transgressions to the Lord. The guilt of our sin is forgiven. Therefore, let all who are faithful offer prayer to you. Many are the torments of the wicked, but the steadfast love surrounds those who trust in the Lord. Excuse me. I give up. There we go. Let's join together in the opening prayer. Loving God, we confess to you many ways we have strayed from your path and fallen short of your will. We find comfort in our scriptures that remind us that even when we are far from you, you are filled with compassion for us and seek to guide us back to you. We offer this prayer knowing that your steadfast love surrounds all who trust in you. Amen. Please be seated. The first scripture reading is from Joshua chapter 5, verses 9 through 12. The Lord said to Joshua, Today I have rolled away from you the disgrace of Egypt. And so that place is called Gilgal to this day. When the Israelites were camped in Gilgal, they kept the Passover in the evening on the 14th day of the month in the plains of Jericho. On the day after the Passover, on that very day, they ate the produce of the land, unleavened cakes and parched grain. The manna ceased on the day they ate the produce of the land, and the Israelites no longer had manna. They ate the crops of the land of Canaan that year. Our second reading is from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 16 through 21. From now on, therefore, we regard no one from a human point of view, even though we once knew Christ from a human point of view. We know him no longer in that way. So if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting the message of reconciliation to us. So we are ambassadors for Christ, since God is making his appeal through us. We entreat you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteous of God. And the third reading is from Luke chapter 15 
verses 1 through 3, and 11b through 32. Now all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to listen to him. And the Pharisees and scribes were grumbling and saying, This fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. There was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that will belong to me. So he divided his property between them. A few days later, the younger son gathered all that he had and traveled to a distant country. And there he squandered his property in dissolute living. When he had spent everything, a severe famine took place throughout that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him to his fields to feed the pigs. He would gladly have filled himself with the pods that the pigs were eating, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired hands have bread enough to, and to spare? But here I am dying of hunger. I will get up and go to my father. And I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired hands. So he set off and he went to his father. But while he was still far off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. Then the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, Quickly, bring out a robe, the best one, and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. And get the fatted calf and kill it. And let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and he is found. And they began to celebrate. Now his elder son was in the field. And when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. He called one of the slaves and asked what's going on. He replied, your brother has come and your father has killed a fatted calf because he has got him back safe and sound. Then he became angry and refused to go in. His father came out and began to plead with him. But he answered to his father, listen, for all these years I have been working like a slave for you and I have never disobeyed your command. Yet you have never given me even a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours comes back, who has devoured your property with prostitutes. You killed the fatted calf for him. And the father said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice, because this brother of yours was dead and has come to life. He was lost and has been found. Here ends the reading. Thanks be to God. Thanks So there was one other announcement I should have made. <laughs> I should have asked if everyone got a piece of paper and had something to write with. I know I went around and tried to make sure everyone got one. If not, I, I think there's still paper in the back. If, the, if anyone, you could just wave to Chad. <laughs> so how many of you have ever been to camp? A lot, OK. Um, Church camp, maybe sports camp, Girl Scout camp, Boy Scout camp, camping. Remember the good old days when you'd go to camp and write letters home? <laughs> I, I, I found this, on, I was actually going to use this instead of the blank paper, but you'll see why I chose the blank paper in a minute. But, and I can't remember what it says at the bottom, but I thought it was cute. <laughs> It's, it's like a, a form to fill out, and at the bottom it says, miss you, you're supposed to circle one at the bottom, and it says, miss you, 
The next one is, what's your name again? <laughs> and then it's like, see you soon, and you know, all of that kind of stuff. But um, I have a box of sort of mementos from my own childhood, and I know I have some letters in there from my grandmother that she wrote to me when I was at camp. And I just realized in thinking about this lesson this week that she would have had to have written them the week before, <laughs> And now probably two weeks before to make sure they get there and then sent them off. So even while I was still at home, she was planning ahead so I would have mail to open when I was at camp. So and that just kind of, you know, that was, wow. My family cared enough to take that extra time to make sure I had mail when I was at camp. So our gospel lesson today tells the story of being distant from those that we love. And I wanted to invite you to think about a time when you were distant when you were away from loved ones, like being away from home for the first time, maybe at camp. What did you miss about home? What did you want to tell the people at home? And were you looking forward to being at home again? So I've given you a paper and a pencil, and I'd like you to actually write a letter to someone that you're distant from or have been distant from. Um, or at least maybe jot down some ideas of what was it that you missed about being home or being close to that person. So write a letter like you would from camp or from college or maybe from a military base you were stationed at or even maybe to people that you missed during the COVID lockdowns. And I'll give you a few minutes to, to do that. If you haven't had time to finish, I invite you to take it home with you. I know a couple people asked if we were having a quiz. This, you, you don't have to mail this letter if you choose not to. <laughs> but my question, I know we've been going through the, the what ifs of the post-pandemic booklet. My question for today is, what if your longing for each other when you were apart 
revealed how much God misses you when you wander. So the, the rest of my message will be talking about the many layers of the story of the prodigal son, but this, this letter exercise is about our relationships with one another, with our loved ones, but also our relationship with God and how much God loves us and wants us to return home and remembers our name. <laughs> As the, as the opening hymn said, God calls us each by name. So all the things that we feel when we are away from the ones we love are the same things that God feels when we distance ourselves from God. So let this letter be a reminder of how much God loves you and misses you when you are far from home. Let us pray. Holy God, it is in our nature to turn from you and try to create our own path and although we often are not worthy to be called your children, today we are reminded once again that you wait for our return with open arms, ready to greet us with celebration and rejoicing. Amen. Amen. So even though it happened in 1987, I'm guessing at least some of you <laughs> will remember the story of baby Jessica. Maybe, yeah, okay. That's... <laughs> Yeah. I asked my husband this morning, he's like, it sounds familiar. And then as I shared some of the details, he's like, oh yeah, I remember that. Um, but I, I remember, it seemed like the entire country, and that time it was television, we didn't have phones to carry around with us to check the news, but everyone sitting in front of the, the TV waiting to see if the efforts of emergency services and engineers and mining experts would be enough to save the life of 18-month-old Jessica McClure who had fallen into a well on her aunt's property, and she was wedged. And then the article, well, the article that I read said she was kind of like bent in half, but if I remember correctly, one of her legs was up and one was down. And I told Joe that every time I do yoga, I think about, <laughs> I just think about how difficult that, and I know she was a lot younger than I am now, but like to be wedged in there in that position and, um, and after conventional rescue techniques failed, they developed a plan to dig another tunnel, and I think they ended up going in below her so that it wouldn't cave in above her. And after several days and everyone watching this unfold, it seemed like Jessica became everyone's child, that everyone felt the pain of that separation and everyone felt that fear of loss. And maybe parents hugged their own children just a little tighter. And after those days, they were eventually able to rescue her, carried her off to waiting parents and doctors, and miraculously she was still alive and except for a broken leg and some scrapes on her head, relatively, at least physically, unharmed. I can't imagine what psychologically that would do to an 18-month-old. But the drama of baby Jessica touched hearts across the country. And for those few days, one lost little girl became lost to everyone. And when she was finally found, the entire nation rejoiced that she was found. In contrast to last week's scriptures, which warned of the coming judgment, this week's gospel lesson shows Jesus telling the ever-critical Pharisees and scribes, that this is the kind of rejoicing that goes on in heaven every time a sinner repents. Instead of painting God as righteous judge condemning sinners to doom, Jesus describes God more as a rescue worker, out combing hillsides looking for lost sheep, searching under beds for lost coins, looking anywhere and everywhere to find those who have strayed. And once those wayward souls have been safely returned to the fold, there's no mention of judgment or any conditional status to test their convictions or their commitment. Instead, there's just rejoicing, celebrations, parties in heaven over that one sinner who was lost that the 99 righteous ones will never know. And to make his point perfectly clear in the way that only Jesus can do, he ends this lesson with a parable. It begins with the words, there was a man who had two sons. Now anyone who was biblically literate and would have heard those words from Jesus' mouth would have recognized them. They were a familiar story um, concept in that time and they would have been inclined to identify with the younger son remembering 
the stories of Cain and Abel, or Ishmael and Isaac, or Esau and Jacob. But biblically literate listeners were in for a surprise in this parable because the younger son turns out not to be the righteous Abel, or the faithful Isaac, or even the clever Jacob, we'll call him. <laughs> but an irresponsible, self-indulgent, and self-centered child, probably the very definition of misspent youth. This younger son also has a lot in common with Joseph, the generosity that he receives from his father, his move to a foreign land, his increasing humiliation, and then finally his restoration. But again, these similarities would have made the parable all the more shocking. If the audience was expecting a hero underdog, they certainly did not find that in the prodigal son. But if we know one thing, it is that our scriptures are rarely, if ever, completely straightforward. Theologian Henry Nouwen once toured St. Petersburg and visited the Hermitage Museum and saw Rembrandt's painting of the prodigal son. And the painting was in a hallway near a window that the, the painting actually received natural light from that window. And he apparently sat there for hours just watching the play of light and, and the changing light across the painting and said that at every change of the light, he saw a different aspect of the painting revealed. I don't know that I've ever sat and watched looked at a painting for two hours plus, but, um, but I think that's kind of Henry Nowen. <laughs> he later wrote about the experience that there are many paintings in the prodigal son as there, there were as many paintings in the prodigal son as there were changes in the day. Last week, we discussed how difficult it can be to hear something new in scriptures that we believe that we know inside and out. But as familiar as the story of being lost and found may be, it contains a multitude of perspectives that maybe we haven't considered before. Maybe as you listen to the story being read, you identified with one of the main three characters, the one who left, or the one who was left behind, or the one who was forced to stay behind and keep things together. Or maybe because of your own life experiences, you identified with more than one of the characters. The younger son whose impatience gets in the way of any wisdom he may have had. Or the father who is often portrayed as indulgent, but could also be seen as supportive and willing to let his younger son make his own choices and also his own mistakes and forge his own way. Or maybe even the faithful older brother who has a really hard time celebrating the return of the sibling who chose to leave. Most commonly, the younger son is seen to represent the sinners and tax collectors that Jesus chose to surround himself with. Without a backward glance, the prodigal son cuts himself off from his family, his friends, his neighbors, his homeland, and heads off into a new land where he does, in fact, prove himself prodigal, wasting his wealth on poor choice after poor choice until he finally looks around him, realizes the situation that he's in, and works up the courage to return to his father, uncertain of how he will be received, and rehearsing his apology in his head. The father is generally seen as God. Before this son even gets close enough to speak the words that he's prepared, his father runs to welcome him with open arms. And this is often criticized, this running to greet his long-lost son. It's argued that any self-respecting patriarch would never so show such care and compassion, that he would instead sit calmly and resolutely waiting for his son to approach him. The consensus among New Testament scholars is that this father's actions are at best undignified and at worst dishonorable. They contend that fathers were remote figures of authority at the time. That the father's running is not only surprising, but is actually shocking, because honorable gentlemen did not run except in case of emergency. They argue that to run, the father would have had to pull up his robes and expose his legs, which would have been shameful. <laughs> they even go so far as to say that in running to his son, this father has left behind his honor, his position, and his community standing as a patriarch. 
all because he ran to greet the son that he had thought lost forever. But just as the sons in this parable mirror other sons in scripture, the father is also a reminder of others who have shown compassion. The Samaritan who saw a wounded man along the side of the road and didn't care where he was from or who he was. And Jesus himself, when he responds to a funeral procession of the only son of a widow, or when he hears of the death of Lazarus, or countless other stories in our scriptures that show Jesus' compassion for others in need. Philo of Alexandria once remarked that parents often do not give up on their wandering children, but instead lavish even more kindness on them than on the well-behaved. And in the same way, God cares for those who live a misspent life, giving them time to repent and maintaining God's merciful nature. So at least there was one scholar who believed that a father could be caring rather than distant, and that that means God, too, is caring rather than distant. And there are other stories contained in Jewish literature showing loving fathers. In one... There's a son of a king who took to evil ways, and the king sent a tutor to him who appealed to him, saying, Repent, my son. But the son sent back the the message, saying, How can I return? I am ashamed to come before you. And the father answered, My son, is the son ever ashamed to return to his father? And is it not to your father that you will be returning? And in another one, a king had a son who had gone astray from his father on a journey of a hundred days. And his friend said to him, return to your father. And he said, I cannot. And then his father sent word, return as far as you can, and I will come the rest of the way to you. And so Jesus says to each one of us, return to me, and I will come running to meet you. We're reminded that the challenge is not in explaining this surprising nature of God when a child returns and is celebrated. The challenge is in getting the wayward child to return in the first place. But what we often miss in this parable, the person that we have not really talked about yet, is the older son and his ambivalence at his brother's return. The older son says to his father, I have been with you this whole time. I have done everything you've wanted and you've ignored me. You had the time to plan this big celebration. You had time to call a band and get the caterers and decorate the hall, and you couldn't even come get me from the fields? We're told of a man who has two sons, but what do we know of this older son? There is an obvious geographical distance between the father and the son who left, but what about the apparent distance between the father and the son who remained? When the younger son left, the father kept nothing back from him. And when this son returned, he once again held nothing back. He loved this son just as fully when he was gone as he did while he was at home. But did he also fully love the son who never left? Or is the question, did this son actually never leave? There are so many ways that relationships can become strained. Yes, taking your money and leaving everything behind will probably put a strain on any relationship. But what about the emotional distance that can grow even though the person is right in front of you? What the scribes and the Pharisees failed to see is that they too were prodigal, just like the sinners and the tax collectors. They believed that they did all the right things, and they couldn't see that they didn't. They too would receive the same celebration in heaven if they would just return to God. And if the older son represents the scribes and Pharisees, are there times that we are like them? Do we grumble about sinners and tax collectors being not only welcomed into the kingdom of God, but celebrated? without ever realizing how far we may have strayed from God. And who among us can honestly say that we have never left? What if our longing for each other when we are apart gives us a sense of how much 
God misses us when we wander. What if God is calling us to return because we just might be the ones who have strayed? Amen. Are there any joys or concer con yeah, concerns to share this morning? That certainly was a joy. Yes, yes, yes. yes. <laughs> Anything else? The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Loving God, who welcomes us back like a parent running to greet a child who has strayed, we come before you seeking your forgiveness. We know that you have provided for us 
that you guide us in your way and that you comfort us in our darkest moments. Give us the strength to put aside our own fears and anxieties and to return to you. Give us the wisdom to act in accordance with your plan. And forgive us for any ways that we have strayed from your path and fallen short of your will, for ways that we have hurt one another. For the times that we are unaware that we actually have strayed. We bring before you our prayers for all your children. Although the world around us is divided, help us to be a source of unity. Although there is injustice in the world, help us to work toward justice for all your children, knowing that we are all made in your image, no matter the color of our skin, the language we speak, or who you have created us to be. Help us to respect and even celebrate our differences and see them as evidence of your infinite creativity and love. And show us as the body of Christ how to reach out to meet the needs of this world in your name, reminding us that despite our differences, we are all one in you. We pray for all your children in need, those who continue to face financial uncertainty and instability, those who are having difficulty finding or keeping a place to live, those who are uncertain where their next meal is coming from, those who struggle with medical care or child care. We pray for any who face health concerns or illness that they might know peace and comfort in your presence. And we lift up those who grieve, especially Becky and Leo, that in their loss they might find strength in you and the hope of eternal life. We pray for all who have lost hope or who struggle with their faith. Let this community of faith be a place of welcome and a reflection of your love for all creation. We bring before you the joys and the concerns that are known to us. We celebrate the joy of music, of hymns that provide comfort and remind us of what we believe. We celebrate that Becky's friend Carolyn has improved and pray for her continued healing as she continues in ICU. We continue to pray for the people of Ukraine, for those who have fled their country and for those who remain behind and continue to pray for peace in our world. And we lift up in prayer all of those on our prayer list. We bring to you these prayers that have been shared aloud as well as the ones that we offer to you only in our hearts. We know that you hear both the words of our mouths and our hearts and that you answer these prayers in your time and according to your will. Continue to guide us in living into the example of our Lord Jesus Christ, who taught us to say when we pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
Let us pray. Generous God, what if we were courageous enough to use the gifts we offer to bring your will to completion here and now? Guide us in moving past fear to faith that it can be done. Amen. Over the past two years, we have known what it's like to be apart from loved ones. And we have a sense of what God experiences when we turn away. So know that God is there, ready to greet you with open arms. As you leave this place and go out into the world, know that you go with the love of God, the peace of Christ, and the power of the Holy Spirit. Know that you go as a beloved child of God. Amen.